Alright, what's up everyone? Welcome back to the channel. I'm Tokenizer, and I'm here to bring you guys in-depth news, analysis, and insights from the digital asset space, along with covering the progressive tokenization of the world. And if you haven't already, be sure to check out my other content platforms on Twitter, Telegram, Instagram, Spotify, and Medium for more crypto analysis content just like this. Or just check out tokenizer.network for all my content and platforms in one place. And of course, they'll all be down in the description below. So in today's video, we're going to be taking a deep dive into Quant Network and looking further into some hidden potential connections and some other interesting mentions of them. And as always, the breakdown will be right up above here for you guys to get caught up since we're going to be getting pretty detailed and advanced. So I do suggest you guys get caught up with the breakdown to familiarize yourself with Quant before coming right back. But before we do get started, I just got to remind everyone that I'm not a financial advisor and therefore nothing you hear or read from me will ever be any form of financial or investment advice. But now that we got that out of the way, let's get right into it. Alright, so we've had some pretty serious coverage of Quant Network in the past on a couple occasions. We know the solutions they provide is through their operating system overledger to allow interoperability to essentially any network. It's an any-to-any -any connection, meaning you could connect any two, three, or even five blockchains together to something that might not even be based on a blockchain. And we also know of their innovative idea of MDAPs. These are multi-chain applications. So we have dApps that usually tend to only live on one chain, but sometimes with bridges for other chains to be compatible with. MDAPs will have these dApps natively accessible from multiple chains while also giving it customization to where, say, someone might want to build their application on ETH because it's the most widely known smart contract layer one, but they want the security from Bitcoin's consensus and maybe they want the scaling of XRP. Well, that's all possible thanks to Overledger. So that's basically a TLDR of what Quant and Overledger does. We'll kind of be dividing this deep dive into a couple sections for just organization purposes. And of course, timestamps will be right down below for you guys to jump to the part you want to hear about. All right, well, with that said, let's get started into the first section and let's look at how the idea for Quant Network all started out. So this is essentially a fintech startup that Quant CEO Gilbert Verdian had started out after his years serving at multiple government organizations like the UK, Australia, Europe, and even the US. Gilbert had initially gone some inspiration for all this during his time working with the Australian government. And I'll try my best not to go on a whole rabbit hole about Gilbert Verdian because you guys have probably heard enough about that, but just know that this guy's probably has some of the deepest connections to governments, policymakers, and central banks out there in the crypto asset space. While working in the governmental health department in New Southern Wales, Gilbert was getting really frustrated at the fact that he wasn't able to easily sync and interoperate patient healthcare data from different systems because of silos in legacy technology. But instead of just complaining about it, he worked to build a solution around it. In fact, this solution was so great that even ISO, the International Organization for Standardization, had reached out to Gilbert and were like, we're really liking what you're doing. Can we turn this into an ISO standard? So of course Gilbert said yes. Now keep in mind ISO is the largest standard setting body in the world, with over 150 countries as their members, where once ISO mandates a standard, all these other supporting countries within ISO have to abide by. So having ISO come and say that is absolutely massive. And this of course eventually led to what is now ISO TC307, the standard for blockchain and DLT interoperability, governance, and a whole lot of other things that we see here. And of course this idea of interoperability and connecting things together that normally don't connect, but probably should, likely became quite an area of interest for Gilbert Verdian. In fact, so much so that he started out a fintech revolving around building a solution for universal interoperability. Since then, they've built up quite a strong team with really relevant connections to what they're building towards. So now that we understand the history behind Quant, let's take a look at some of their team members. So we've already talked about Gilbert, but come on, we can't be making a quant focused video and not highlight more of this guy's background. So let's just do a quick rundown again. 
Gilbert started out working at Ernest & Young. This is one of the big four accounting firms, and he was there for a good four years as their senior security manager. Then, he spent a good six years at DXC Technologies as a senior security architecture in addition to a consultant manager. So DXC is a multinational IT company traded on the NASDAQ. He then moved on to Her Majesty's Treasury as their Deputy Chief Technology Officer and Chief Security Officer. Kind of what Her Majesty's Treasury is focused on is the financial, fiscal, and economic policies within the United Kingdom. And this is one of the oldest treasuries in the world, dating all the way back to the year 1066. So there's definitely some history behind Her Majesty's Treasury. Then he spent a short seven months at HSBC. This is one of the top banks in the world, and he served as their security programmy. And HSBC over the past couple years or so have been really well known to be one of the few banks that are really backing Arthur's Corda. And we're going to be talking a lot more on Corda later. And then he spent a year and a half at the Ministry of Justice in UK as their security lead. The Ministry of Justice pretty much takes care of all court cases within the UK, whether it's civil, tribunals, family law hearings, and of course other criminal cases. So that's another piece to the core UK economy and system that Gilbert Verdian definitely has some ties to. Then Gilbert decided to go down under into the Australian government, working in their health and financial services department. And as we covered, it was actually during this time that Gilbert had created the idea of ISO TC307. So he was down in New Southern Wales as their chief information securities officer for about three years. This then leads us to Vocalink, where he served as Chief Information Securities Officer again for another two years. This is a payments company that MasterCard holds a 94% stake in. And there's a ton of connections between Vocalink that either directly or indirectly tie to Quant. But for now, just know that Gilbert Verdian had won Chief Information Securities Officer of the Year in 2017 during his time at Vocalink. These were just the positions he's held as a job along with him founding TC307. But let's quickly go over some of his other accolades. He also served as a member of the EU Commission for a good three years, where he was in the role for blockchain policy and framework. Now what's really interesting about this is, if any of you guys have caught the LCX Deep Dive in our previous video, you would have heard about this bill titled MICA. This stands for Markets and Crypto Assets, and it's a bill that's revolved around regulating the space in Europe that's been quite the talk for some time now, and of course this was drafted up by the EU Commission. In fact, it was drawn up in September 2020. This was during the same time that Gilbert Verdian was still a member of the EU Commission. And what's even more interesting is that there's three connections to Quant mentioned in that paper defining them as a proper example of being a regulated player in this space. And these three were SDX, Swiss Digital Exchange, LSEG, London Stock Exchange Group, and LCX. But more on just how these all connect to Quant in just a bit. And while there's no official confirmation whether Gilbert was actually responsible for drafting up parts of the MICA bill, there are some leads to there that definitely do seem pretty prominent. Especially the fact that he was working under blockchain and policy framework within the EU Commission, which is pretty much what MICA is. He also had spent some time working in the central bank environment, having volunteered at both the Bank of England and the US Federal Reserve, where he helped in the cross-market operations resilience groups for the Bank of England, which in layman's terms just kind of means they were a group of people responsible for overseeing risks in the financial markets, especially in cybersecurity. And then over at the US Federal Reserve, where he helped with the Secure Payments Task Force and the Fed Payments Improvement Plan, where he offered advice on creating a more secure and efficient payment system within the United States. He also held a chair position in the British Standard Institute DLT committee for the UK standardization group of TC307, and this was from 2017 to 2021. And this is a global UK-based organization that operates in over 150 countries working alongside the UK government, as the recognized UK national standards body that's also, of course, a member of ISO. And then he also co-founded and co-chairs the Interoperability Working Group for INATBA. This is the International Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications, and this consortium sees a bunch of big tech, crypto, and fintech companies 
working with policymakers to build a secure future for the business application side of blockchain and DLT. All right, now let's move on a little bit from Gilbert and highlight a couple of the other members. So there's also Gilbert's wife, Laura Verdian, who serves as their chief operating officer. And interestingly enough, she held a head of healthcare services position at Quant, which is a sector Quant's been building with in silence for quite some time now. But Laura's also had some really relevant experience to have held a position like that. Prior to Quant, she had four years as a director at Deloitte, but before all this, she was very focused within the healthcare industry, having previously worked for GSK, ISI, Intercept, and Pfizer. These are all big multi-billion healthcare and pharmaceutical companies. And of course, we know Gilbert also has quite some relevant experience working in the healthcare sector down in Australia. So honestly, pretty exciting to see what Quant will do to disrupt this industry, because there's tons of silos within healthcare data. And just recently, over the past six months or so, Quant actually also hired a chief marketing officer too. And well, if you've been keeping a close eye on the progress in development, it's been pretty noticeable in the way they've been presenting themselves and delivering their content. And that's all thanks to Andrew Carrier. Before making the move to Quant though, this guy had quite a background in the world of traditional finance. He started out his career at JP Morgan in reconciliations before moving to Swift for a good 8 years as their global head of marketing and PR. Now to have a position of that level at Swift, the company that's responsible for moving $5 trillion every day around the world is not something to look over. He then decided to go into the investment banking route and spent some time at Deutsche Bank as, again, head of marketing for about three years. And this is one of the top 20 banks in the world. So again, a pretty big accomplishment to be holding a head of marketing position for an investment bank of that caliber. So obviously Andrew's got a ton of relevant experience working in marketing and the fintech sector for quite some time now. And I'm sure he's built up some nice connections during his time that will definitely connect to Quant one day. Their chief product officer is Martin Hargreaves, who also worked at Vocalink and likely met Gilbert there. Though Martin had spent a good 13 years there, climbing all the way from architect up to vice president. I think that really goes to show the work ethic and resilience that Martin has, which we've seen carry over to Quant too from seeing his work on ODAP with MIT. There's also Luke Riley. This is the head of innovations and he's responsible for the entire R&D team while always trying to search for new features and testing the limits to their Overledger API gateways. And while Luke doesn't quite have the crazy history that Andrew Carrier might have, he does work with ISO and the Internet Engineering Task Force towards pushing the technical standardization of DLTs around the world. So it's pretty nice to see that Luke is working alongside these global standard setting bodies. But on top of this, he's also worked for the University of Liverpool in research and development for AI distributed systems, along with King's College London, where he developed a six week course for DLT. And then just going over their two advisors real quick, we covered these two in the breakdown, but they're pretty big names, so I'll just mention them quickly again. There's Neil Smith, who was the ex CEO and chairman for Comcast where he helped scale it out to one of the largest telecommunications network in North America. So obviously Neil has some experience within the network effects. He also oversaw AOL back in the early days of the internet, along with also being an advisor to Qualcomm, which is a publicly traded company on the NASDAQ that manufactures semiconductor products and operates in over 40 countries. And then of course, Guy Dietrich. Guy spent his first 26 years at Morgan Stanley as their managing director in Silicon Valley, leading their largest private wealth management group. He then moved to another big investment bank in UBS for a good three years, again, as their managing director. And UBS is actually the third largest bank in Europe and the largest in all of Switzerland. Then, most notably, of all his experience, he spent three years as the managing director for Rockefeller Management. This is the same Rockefeller management affiliated with John D. Rockefeller. This is the man who's often proclaimed to be the richest man alive at one point, owning over 90% of all the oil in the US. So you don't get a position like managing director at Rockefeller just because you're good at your job. You've got to get some crazy high level connections to even get your foot in the door. So now that we know who the teams are connected to, 
let's open up the gateways into their partnerships before we bridge into their other connections. You guys like how I connected those interoperability puns? <laughs> So, of course, we know they're working with Sia, which is actually now Nexi since their merger for 15 billion euros that happened earlier in 2021. And so Sia is a payments railway kind of company providing the infrastructure to payments like SEPA. And they've got over 570 banks in 50 countries that serve as their clients and being the biggest payment provider in all of Europe. They've got their own network, Sia Chain, that's working to be compatible and interoperable with R3's Corda, a very close partner of theirs. We know that Quant and Sia had already tested for DLT interoperability and succeeded doing so on multiple platforms, including their own Sia Chain, Corda, JP Morgan's Quorum, Hyperledger, Fabric, and Ethereum's enterprise platforms. Nexi, on the other hand, is working on the digital euro with the European Central Bank, and this was announced around September of 2021. And while if you're going to digitalize your currency, eventually at some point you're going to have to make it interoperable for cross-border payments with other countries, right? But not only that, even to have all the banks working together, you can't expect all of them to build their applications and services all on one chain, right? Every bank's going to have their own personal preferences. Some might want to use Hyperledger, some might want to use Corda, some might even want to build out their own chain. Well, with interoperability, that's not a problem at all. So I'm sure we're going to continue seeing more development from this end of things, especially given Gilbert's background and history within the EU Commission. In this partnership, they've managed to connect 550 plus banks all together and allow them all to be on Overledger and are now potentially working on the digital euro with the European Central Bank. That's pretty crazy to think about. This is just one partnership. So let's move on to another one. Let's talk about Lackchain. Lackchain, simply put, is a global alliance led by the Interdevelopment Bank, which is a consortium of banks around the world working together to fund the development and reduce the inequality and poverty in the Latin American and Caribbean regions. So there's 48 countries within the Interdevelopment Bank with 22 members being non-borrowers and actual capital providers for the development and some of them are the United States, Canada, Japan, Israel, the Republic of Korea, the People's Republic of China, UK, France, Germany, Spain, Switzerland, Norway, and a whole bunch of other countries. And so these are the guys that form Lackchain, which is essentially working to develop the blockchain ecosystem in Latin America and the Caribbean, right? Needless to say, there's some pretty big players here. Well, Quant joined this alliance alongside some other big companies, such as Telefonica, Grant Thornton, Avalanche, MIT, Ethereum Enterprise Alliance, Consensus, and many, many others. And so their mission being to connect all of Latin America and leverage Overledger to really interconnect the region and have an interbank network between them while opening up payment remittances, so sending money abroad in a super efficient manner between the US and Latin America. And of course, this will all be through the Latin American dollar that Quant's working on with Blockchain. So that's one of the many tokenized currencies that they'll be working on which is pretty huge. And again, this is one partnership alone. I mean, think of it. In this one single partnership, they managed to connect a whole continent together, work alongside some huge banks and a consortium of other big private sector companies, and build the Latin American dollar. That is quite an insane partnership. And of course, there's also Oracle, in which Quant went from being accepted into their startup ecosystem to being their primary interoperability solution for their blockchain platform. Between Gilbert and Oracle, they also collaborated on Oracle's blog on a case study for cross-ledger interoperability along with an interview with the content and strategy manager for Oracle. Now what a lot of people don't know about this partnership is that thanks to being accepted within the Oracle startup ecosystem, Quant actually got the chance to go to Cyboss for co-marketing of both their products and services. Now for those who don't know about Cyboss, Cyboss stands for Swift Interbank Operations Seminar. I know that name already sounds kind of crazy. It's basically an annual gathering held by Swift and it's the largest financial services event with people all over the world from places like JP Morgan, Accenture, Oracle, R3, Microsoft, Natixis, Six, and a whole bunch more. But you guys can kind of see that 
It's a lot of enterprise fintech and investment banks that are here. And so unless you have connections into Swift, you don't get to go to Cyboss. So this happening for Quant back in 2019 when they were still much smaller than they are today, especially in terms of building out connections with other companies and also having broadcast the abilities of Quant and Overledger to a much more properly targeted audience fit for their solutions. Now, as for the Oracle side of things, we got to keep in mind that this is a legacy tech giant, right? They're one of the largest tech companies in the world with a recorded over 25 million cloud users that they're supporting. And in the world of legacy markets, mergers and acquisitions are a huge thing. They pretty much mean when one bigger company buys the ownership of another smaller one. And while Oracle being a tech giant, they've got quite a few mergers and acquisitions over the years. So let's take a look into one of the more recent ones real quick and see if Quant and Overledger could potentially have some synergy with these in the future. So most recently, they acquired Cerner for $28 billion. So that's no small amount of money and goes to show that Cerner was a pretty competent company in that sense. Cerner's a sort of health IT supplier company and they provide things around healthcare tech like patient information exchange from electronic records, management software, analytics, all the way to even medical hardware. And well, if we look on their page here, Oracle Cerner, there's a line here that's quite interesting, open and interoperable. I'm sure you guys can already feel some quant vibes from that. And while there's very little leads to this, what we do know is that Quant is of course partnered with Oracle. Oracle recently acquired Cerner. Quant also has had quite some works in the health sector from Gilbert and Lara's past, along with Interopen, and I'm sure some additional operations within GovUK, and they've also had meetings and talks with Pfizer, which is where Lara previously worked. So I don't think it's too crazy to think that there may be some synergy here down the line, especially with how siloed the healthcare industry is. So those were kind of the big main partnerships, right? Of course, there's also the ones with GovUK where Overledger is offered on their government digital marketplace. And then some other ones like the consortiums they've joined and of course their crypto partnerships. So let's just quickly touch up on these before we move on from the partners. GovUK, as we mentioned, has listed Overledger onto their government tech marketplace as a solution, which is huge because how often are you going to see a crypto solution being offered on a government marketplace? And well, speaking about the UK, the Bank of England is, of course, the central bank for the UK. And as we know, Gilbert also spent some time there within their cross-market operations resilience groups. Well, here's what the head of future tech at the Bank of England, William Lovell, had to say about Quant and Overledger. Which is a network of networks blockchain, which is an interesting uh, product. Tech company unveils network of networks to solve blockchain's interoperability issue for trade. So this is uh, a firm called Quant Network uh, that have launched a product called Overledger. I had a preview of this from one of the people from Quant uh, a few weeks ago before their uh, presentation at Cybos. Okay, so this is quite an interesting product. The idea is it creates a common language that sits across different blockchain networks and potentially creates a, a connectivity backbone. They are pretty confident that they can link transactions that start on one blockchain platform and move over onto another. Um, I know that they're particularly interested in uh, trade finance space because as the uh, article notes here, there are several competing uh, consortia and competing platforms. And I think they're pitching to be able to uh, join these together. Now, I've got some quite good contacts into this company. So that's some pretty juicy stuff. And then there's the Digital Pound Foundation, a private sector organization working to tokenize the British pound. And we see some other members partaking in this action, such as Ripple, Electronium, Avalanche, and then some fintech companies like Accenture, CGI, and even STX was in one of their webinars. So some of you guys are probably thinking like, well, why is this the private sector's job? This should be up to the governments and the public sector since they control the currency. Well, the UK government actually came out saying that they wanted this push to tokenize currencies to be a collaborative effort from both the public and private sectors. And this is especially visible when you check the GovUK website and see that the Digital Pound Foundation is actually listed right there. So yeah, that's some pretty juicy stuff, and I'm sure there's a lot more brewing within the UK behind the scenes. 
Next up, let's talk about Moby. They're a consortium built out of the world's largest car manufacturers, tech companies, crypto startups, non-government organizations, transit agencies, financial institutions, and smart city leaders. So this is quite a wild conglomerate, right? What could all this possibly be for? Well, Moby stands for Mobility Open Blockchain Initiative. And their missions to build global standards, specifically in the automotive industry, to allow for things like autonomous vehicles to become a reality. And while we won't go all the way down the Moby rabbit hole, essentially what they're planned to do is to create a digital twin of a physical vehicle, so tokenizing it, and in return allowing micropayments in between everything. So like the road usage and carbon emissions linked to that said digital twin of the car, while also allowing users within the economy to sell services and data, or allowing others to use the said car when they're not using it, and even getting incentivized in credits for things like using green energy or using public transit. Overall, it's a super interesting idea and really is pushing towards this whole idea of the fourth industrial revolution of IoT and automation. And while if we take a look at some of the members in here, of course we see some huge names in a variety of industries. From things like the European Commission, World Economic Forum, to Accenture, R3, Ripple, Quant, Hyperledger, IOTA, IBM. Of course, there's car manufacturers like Toyota, Mazda, Honda, Ford, Hyundai, and a long list of others. They're also, of course, a part of the Hyperledger Foundation. Hyperledger is a non-profit multi-project ecosystem with a bunch of enterprise industry-focused blockchain products, and, and all of Hyperledger was created by the Linux Foundation. So these projects could really be a rabbit hole in their own, but we'll quickly summarize these. So for their already fully developed and what they call graduated projects, there's Hyperledger Ares, which is focused on an interoperable toolkit for transmitting and storing verifiable digital credentials. So for example, things like driver's license or concert tickets. Hyperledger Besu is actually an Ethereum client and its focus is around creating an enterprise friendly private or public permission network for businesses and consortium purposes. Hyperledger Fabric. This is probably the most popular Hyperledger out there from what I've noticed, and it's pretty similar to Besu, with the main difference being that Fabric is much more focused towards being a private network than Besu. But because of its simplicity of integrations of things like consensus and membership services and versatility in design, it makes it very fitting for countless industries to use. Hyperledger Indie is focused towards building tools and a library of components to have digital identities rooted onto the blockchain or other DLTs so they can be interoperable across other domains and applications. Hyperledger Iroha is focused on IoT-based projects that require DLT, so perhaps things like data exchange and data sharing. And it has a very simple integration process, and on top of all that, it's also crash fault tolerant, meaning that even if certain nodes or components within the network fail, they can still reach consensus like how they normally would. And so those are the main graduated Hyperledger products. On the Hyperledger Foundation end, this is a consortium of companies similar to what we saw with Moby across various industries. And as we can see here, it ranges from things like finance, IoT, supply chain, governments, academias, etc. And their focus is to develop suitable frameworks and tools for enterprise-grade blockchain development. So this is pretty exciting to see Quant working in here, working with some of the biggest names in the world to push the idea of real enterprise usage in blockchain technology, right? And then of course, we also talked about Inatba earlier during Gilbert's background, where not only is Quant a founding member of, but Gilbert serves as the co-chair of standardization and interoperability. And here we can see some of the other members from Inatba. And now to wrap up the partners, let's talk about their crypto focused ones real quick. So we already mentioned this in the breakdown of Quant, but just as a quick refresher, and as always the breakdowns to these projects Quant's partnered with will be right up in the corner. There's Constellation, which Quant is working with to create the vision of smart cities and a truly interconnected world through IoT and automation together. There's a fair bit to this partnership and it's quite the rabbit hole, so I'll link the video breaking down this whole partnership right above. 
Then there's also their collaborations with LCX. This one's focused on building the infrastructure of LCX by integrating an overledger gateway into the platform. They're also working on research and development for CBDC interoperability. And if you check out the LCX Deep Dive, we've covered some juicy bits between the central banks between Singapore and Canada and their development with the CBDC. Unison, which Gilbert serves as a strategic advisor for, but they also plan to build an overledger gateway into their exchange infrastructure. And also their Xenix Incubator, which is their incubation program, will actually be supporting incubation for overledger MDAPs, which is really exciting to see, especially with their DMAS function, where if you stake Unison's ZCX tokens, you get tokens from their Xenix incubator back in return. So there's a chance we could be seeing multi-ledger tokens being distributed for supporting the Unison ecosystem. Alliance Block, their partnership is focused on allowing the simple integration of Overledger into their platform for both them and enterprises to build innovative DeFi products onto the Alliance Block platform. But also there's been talks of Rashid saying they'll actually be using Overledger to bridge the institutional clients from their partnership with London Stock Exchange to connect them to Alliance Block's products. Now, before we dive into the connections, we got to talk about what is perhaps the biggest operation in all of crypto that's seen backing and support from guys like the US government, Intel, IBM, Hyperledger, Visa, and, and of course I'm talking about ODAP, Open Digital Asset Protocol, which they unfortunately call SAT now, Secure Asset Transfer. I really thought ODAP was a pretty sick name, though I'd argue Secure Asset Transfer does make more sense, as by saying Open Digital Asset Protocol, you're referring that things operate in silo naturally and you need this protocol to make it an open ecosystem versus Secure Asset Transfer, where it's almost implied that these systems will already be interoperable, just like modern internet. It's just that they're implying it's transferred across networks in a secure manner now. And if you guys haven't already, I'd suggest you checking out this interview I did with Greg Lunt, which many of you guys are familiar with. Definitely one of the most well-recognized and hardworking quant researchers out there. So that link will be right up here. And in the first half, we basically went real in depth into what ODAP or SAT, whichever you want to call it is, how it works, the benefits it brings, and the overall scale and vision for it. I'm just going to call this standard ODAP for the rest of the video for convenience purposes, but just know that they're the same thing. Simply put, it's working to be like what TCP IP is for the internet by having an open standard allowing essentially economic value to be sent from any network to any other network without having to tamper with the underlying layer itself, so the layer one, in a secure manner. And it's currently under review with the Internet Engineering Task Force, which like another ISO, except it's for internet standards. And they say it'll probably take another year or two to fully get everything vetted and verified. And I mean, when you're transacting economic value, you'd better make sure that these things are battle tested and verified to the max before it comes into live production, right? So now that we've gotten a further understanding on the scale of what Quant, Overledger, and ODAP is, who their team is, and their partners, we can start drawing some connections. So let's dive down the rabbit hole. Let's first go back to SIA and their partnership. So we know Quant solved interoperability for them, and not just for SIA chain, but also for Ethereum Enterprise clients, JP Morgan's Quorum, Hyperledger Fabric, and R3's Corda. And again, the name R3 is going to pop up a lot for the rest of this video. Their blockchain Corda is pretty much the main enterprise grade private blockchain that's being used in the financial sector. So of course their name is constantly mentioned around CBDCs. In fact, they're so focused on CBDCs, they've even got someone there with the title Head of CBDCs. And that's held by Ricardo Correa, which Gilbert Verdine was actually in a webinar with, alongside some other players within this industry of fintech and CBDCs, like Finality. So SIA is actually also partnered with R3 to accelerate blockchain applications within banking and corporations. Interesting. Let's see who else SIA is partnered with. Payments Canada for Canada's new high value payment system, Lynx, which is of course owned by the Bank of Canada, Canada's central bank. So this partnership formed back in late 2018, early 2019, 
and Quantum Sia partnered in mid 2020. So there's not so much to that. But if we go forward a little more, we also see that Payments Canada had also partnered with Vocalink as their solution for clearance and settlements for their real time rail, as they can run in parallel to chaps and backs while also being ISO 22022 compliant, fit for the future of finance. Of course, we know Gilbert had worked there and won Chief Information Securities Officer of the Year. Martin Hargreaves also worked there for a good 13 years. But what many people don't know is that their previous CTO, Colin Patterson, also worked at Vocalink as a lead information security architect during the same time Gilbert and Martin were there. And they ended up winning Financial Services Team of the Year in 2018 together. So there's definitely some chemistry going on between these guys. Now, since we're on the topic of previous Quant employees, let's also look at Paolo Tasca. He was actually a co-founder and chief strategist for a good year and a half. Since then, he's seemed to work around the world in a bunch of other academias. In addition to what looks to be some very relevant connections to Hedera Hashgraph. But what if I told you there were still some indirect affiliations to Quant? If we look here, what we do see is from April 2017 to present, he's also a committee member at ISO for a specific standard. And of course, that's ISO TC307, the standard for blockchains and distributed ledgers, founded by none other than Gilbert Verdian. And well, let's see who else is a committee member of ISO TC307. So we head over to some of the speakers at Cordacon this year. This is an annual networking event held by R3 for some of the top industry players. And let's take a look at Daniel Iden. This is an advisor for the Bank for International Settlements. And this is the central bank of central banks, having just about any G7 or G20 nations central banks in this consortium. The role of advisor for the BIS is not a small task by any means. We take a look at some of Daniel's previous experiences and we see some work with the Israel Defense Systems and R3. But we also see here at Standards Council Canada, which is the Canadian organization that works to voluntarily mandate standards. And well, what other standard would he be looking to accelerate the adoption of besides, you guessed it, TC307. And the Bank for International Settlements will connect more of in just a minute. We've kind of fallen into a rabbit hole within a rabbit hole there, but I'm sure you guys are kind of starting to see these connection lines forming together. So let's get back on track. With all this new information, how else does this tie to Quant? Well, of course, those ISO TC307 positions tie right to Gilbert and thus the standard that Quant was built on. But before falling down that rabbit hole, we were also talking about the Bank of Canada and Quant. So what relevance does all this have? Well, we mentioned Daniel Iden, who's an advisor to the Bank for International Settlements and a committee member to ISO through Standards Council Canada, right? Speaking of Canada, the Bank of Canada, of course, being a member of the Bank for International Settlements, has their own CBDC project, Project Jasper. This has some very close ties to Singapore's CBDC project, Ubin in which they plan to find a solution for cross-border ecosystems together. And if we look into the Project Jasper papers specifically about the ones talking about cross-border interoperability, what do we see? We stumble upon this paragraph that mentions there needs to be a standardization on interoperability that permits interoperability through other ledgers and networks. It almost sounds like they're trying to mention ODAP or TC307 here without directly saying it. Then in the paragraph below, they straight up talk about ISO, which has this objective in mind, which we of course know is TC307, right? And then they mention R3's Corda is also working on an interoperability solution. And as we know, Quant's already solved that for them. Now, if that wasn't enough, take a look in the ODAP draft from April. Both Yubin and Jasper were listed as an example in the paper. Now, I know that's not saying a ton, but now let's take a look into the Project Yubin side of their papers with this information. What do we see here? Talks of API gateways for interoperability. Now, just most recently, Gilbert Verdian was also attending a CBDC panel hosted by Financial Times Live, where he was also joined by Thomas Harjano, CTO of MIT Connection Sciences and co-author of ODAP alongside Martin Hargraves, Charlotte Hogg, which is the CEO of Visa Europe. And remember, Visa had cited ODAP and a gateway interoperability protocol in their Universal Payments Channel white paper. 
and then Timothy Lane, the deputy governor for the Bank of Canada. I mean, this whole panel has connections both directly and indirectly between them all over the place. And while I can't show you guys the actual panel due to copyright reasons, I can tell you guys that Thomas Harjano did say that Quant was solving interoperability the right way through open standardization. Now that speaks volumes. Keep in mind Harjano is also working with Quant and many other entities to build out ODAP to allow for this open ecosystem and essentially have this be what TCPIP is for our current internet. And MIT was also the ones who founded TCPIP. And well, as we know, History doesn't always repeat itself, but it often does rhyme. Since we mentioned the BIS and their CBDC projects, let's quickly take a look at a couple others that also mention API gateways or have hints of quant in there. We won't be going too in depth here as I've previously made a video on CBDCs connecting to quant, but some of these that we're seeing talks of API gateways include Project Dunbar, which is between the central banks in Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, and South Africa to test for multiple CBDCs on a single platform. And we can see API gateways in the diagram up here. Project MCBDC or Mbridge, or what many others refer to as Inathon Line Rock. I'm just going to be referring to this as Mbridge. This one's between the central banks of the United Arab Emirates, Hong Kong, China, and Thailand to test for more efficient and automated clearances on international transfers and forex operations. And here is another diagram of an API gateway found in their white paper. And the last BIS CBDC project we'll take a look at is Project Helvetia. This one is focused on settlements of foreign currencies and tokenized assets. Though this one's a little different from the previous two where it takes some level of knowledge to understand API gateways, which essentially refer to ODAP. This one is more of the mentions of an ISO gateway, translating the transaction to an SDX language, and the interoperability between real-time growth settlement systems onto a DLT, which is interoperability on a legacy to DLT basis. No one else is solving that, besides Quant's Overledger. That's universal interoperability, right? Okay, so now we've got a better understanding on CBDCs and the BIS. Let's take a look at what's really going on behind all this with CBDCs. So there's quite a few mentions of APIs and gateways for interoperability in these papers, and I really wouldn't be surprised if Daniel Iden was responsible for a large part of this given his position and background. But let's take a look back to MIT. So what we've been seeing in their collaborations between each other is, of course, their work in ODAP, and then their shared panel on CBDCs on Financial Times back in late April of this year. But if we take a look at the MIT connections, we see the, that the Federal Reserve, Bank of Canada, and Bank of England have all announced to collaborate with MIT on research for CBDCs, which is really interesting because if we look at the timelines of these events, MIT and Quant started collaborating back in 2020, and this caught attention from guys like the US government, IBM, and Intel. And as they advanced further and had more entities taking interest, especially as talks of it picked up more towards the latter half of 2021, and they came up with a much improved draft in late November of 2021. Just about two months later, the US Federal Reserve comes out saying that they'll be working with MIT for the technical frameworks for a CBDC. And of course, we know Gilbert had some work at the Federal Reserve for their Secure Payments Task Force and their Payments Improvements Plan. So there's surely some connections there. Then, just a month later, on March 16th, the Bank of Canada comes out saying that they'll also be working with MIT on CBDC research. And while we mention all the connections lying between Quant and the Bank of Canada already, between SIA and Vocalink, and those interesting mentions of ISO and an interoperability protocol through standardization, and then of course the site of API gateways within Project Ubin's paper. And then nine days later, on March 25th, the Bank of England announces they'll also be working with MIT for CBDC research. And of course, we know the history between Gilbert here and what William Lovell had said about Overledger previously. And just to add a little more onto the Bank of England, take a look at this page from a World Economic Forum document that talks about the Bank of England platform model. And what do we see here? More APIs. So the timeline that these line up are real interesting. And while 
from some of the stuff we've discussed, such as Jasper and Yubin having mentions of quant-like things, such as API gateways, well, I don't think it's too far-fetched whatsoever to think that these central banks are working with MIT with the main focus of ODAP right at the forefront of it. But while we're on the topic of ODAP, Hyperledger also has come out showing their support of this standard, as seen here from Cactus and Weaver. And now for this next rabbit hole, we're going to be using more research from Greg Lunt. And the link to this thread we'll be using will be right down below. So in this thread, Greg broke down how Quant connects to Meta. Yes, that Meta, the one that was previously called Facebook. So this first starts off with Telefonica. This is a networking company based in Madrid, Spain. And they've got their own blockchain product called TrustOS. Now check out how they describe this product. Easily integrate blockchain through APIs. Create and manage tokens. Deploy APIs. Use any programming language. Well, every single one of those things, Overledger also does, especially the first and last one. Easily integrate blockchains through APIs. Nothing else out there is doing that. Use any programming language. Well, that's one of the things Overledger is solving, right? As William Lovell had said, sitting over top of blockchains to find common language. So there's some speculation that TrustOS is actually a white label of Overledger. But there's much more to this. Telefonica had also recently joined Lackchain back in April of this year. Now, now, to add on to that, Spain, where Telefonica is headquartered, is also one of the countries that will be under the Lackchain Alliance. And we'll come back to Spain in just a minute, but let's touch up on Meta quickly. Now, I'm sure by now we've all heard of Facebook's change to Meta, with a focus on the development for Web3 and the Metaverse. This came with a presentation by Mark Zuckerberg, and well, let's take a listen to what he says here. Teleporting around the Metaverse is going to be like clicking a link on the internet. It's an open standard. In order to unlock the potential of the metaverse, there needs to be interoperability. And that goes beyond just taking your avatar and digital items across different apps and experiences, which we are already building an API to support. You want to know that when you buy something or create something, that your items will be useful in a lot of contexts and you're not going to be locked into one world or platform. To unlock the potential of the metaverse, there needs to be interoperability, open standards, building an API to support interoperability. Interesting, hey? Then, just two weeks after the big announcement, Mark hopped on a Gary Vee's podcast to talk about this big move where he used the word interoperability five times in seven minutes. And here, Greg cut up an amazing clip of Mark repeating interoperability back to back. In the metaverse, I think it's going to be fundamentally more interoperable. It's designed in a way to be fundamentally interoperable. You know, obviously, there's more technology now that can make it more interoperable, especially if we can get it to be interoperable. So I think having it be more interoperable is going to be key to making the whole thing so dynamic. Just awkwardly staring at Gilbert Verdian. And Gilbert Verdian even made a nice little comment on this. Interoperable. Yes, Mark. Nonetheless, interoperability seems to be quite a point of focus for Mark. And while you could argue it's a common buzzword that a lot of other crypto projects use, such as Chainlink, Polkadot, Cosmos, etc., you're about to see more quant and Gilbert kind of language in here that'll really get you thinking. So a month after the announcement, Meta comes out and says they'll be putting Spain at the heart of the company's future. And to add even further onto that, they're working to build the Metaverse Innovations Hub in Madrid. Now of all places in the world, what made them choose Madrid? Well, remember how Telefonica is based in Spain, Madrid? Guess whose network infrastructure Meta is using for this mission? That's right, Telefonica. All right, now back to Telefonica in February of this year. They also partnered with Oracle to move their critical systems in Spain to Oracle's cloud infrastructure and become the host partner for the Oracle Cloud Madrid region. And in return, allowing Telefonica to offer Oracle cloud services to their own clients. And of course, we know Quant's ties to Oracle, specifically their startup program and the blockchain platform. But one point that's often overlooked is that Oracle Cloud also has certified Quant as their interoperability solution just last year. So there's a blockchain consortium made of 500 plus companies to democratize blockchain in Spain. Alastria, this is a blockchain consortium made of 500 plus companies to develop and democratize blockchain in Spain. 
They've also partnered up with Telefonica to build an enterprise blockchain network for the consortium on Hyperledger Fabric, and they're even providing interoperability for that consortium. But Quants also got their own connections to Elastria. This was a panel discussion during Gilbert's time serving in the EU Commission, where he talked about scalability, interoperability, and sustainability of this space. And who do we also see on this panel? The Chief Technology Officer of Elastria. Interesting. Alright, now back to Meta. Their president of global affairs, Nick Clegg, wrote a Medium article titled Making the Metaverse, What It Is, How It Will Be Built, and Why It Matters. And this was a very detailed 8,000 word article. So Meta's blog created their own spin-off of this. And their title here is really eye-catching. Take a look at it. Ensuring an open and interoperable metaverse. And what do we see in here? A lot of talks of an open standard to allow for interoperability. And here, the name drop of the IETF, who again, is the one responsible for reviewing ODAP. And also check out this layered architecture diagram they've drawn. This is eerily similar to how Thomas Harjano had described the layered architecture to ODAP. And here it is highlighted in Greg's previous thread on ODAP about how there needs to be a structured layer architecture for interoperability to flow right. When you begin addressing specific use cases, then certain other layers have to come into play. You can't cram in everything into one layer. You need to figure out your layered architecture up and down and say which section goes where. When these two gateways begin to open connection and then eventually execute ODAP, they need to find out who these guys are. Who is responsible legally for operating that gateway? Things need to happen first at the legal layer before we can actually move assets. And the reason is because when you're moving assets, unlike the internet, it's not just moving bytes, you're moving economic value. So Nick Clegg, the global head of affairs for Meta, was the one who spurred up that whole blog post by Meta. And well, if we take a look at Nick's background, we see that both Gilbert Verdian and Nick were not only both in UK at the same time, but both of them were holding high level government positions within finance, security, and overall politics. So it's very likely that at one point, these two had crossed paths and connected. And then towards the end of this thread, Greg gives his thoughts quickly, and it's really the perfect way to close out this rabbit hole. To be an open standard, you need to be working out in the open with other standard setting bodies. We don't talk about interoperability like that in the beginning, middle, and end of your like big presentation unless you actually have a solution. And he says teleporting around the metaverse is like clicking a link on the internet. It's an open standard. Open standard is a Gilbertism. People were like, well, if it's not quant, like couldn't Facebook just build their own in-house solution for this? No. To be an open standard, you need to be working with global standardizing bodies in the open. And you need to be sharing and working collaboratively. And you can't do that in the dark. You can't build your own in-house solution and then call it an open standard. That's complete oxymoron. So there's a high chance, in my opinion, that Zuckerberg is hype about interoperability because he knows that Quan has actually solved it. And from what we've seen, there's only so many open standards out there and even less that are getting as much backing as ODAP is. Now, I think we've gone down quite enough rabbit holes for this video, so let's quickly discuss some points regarding the QNT token. And if you guys have already seen the LCX Deep Dive, you'll be familiar with some of these, as the activity here is rather identical. So these are all Coinbase to wallet transactions, and well, what do we see here? Just like the LCX withdrawals from Coinbase with copious amounts and crazy amounts of repetition being sent out. And if we also check here, we see some of the top quant wallets. And once you get to number 90 or so, you realize that the total QNT held by each of these wallets are showing crazy amounts of repetition. And of course, those repetitive transactions were also the ones that filled these wallets. And just like LCX wallets, these wallets have absolutely nothing else. No history of previous transactions or interactions with previous tokens or smart contracts. No movement of anything whatsoever. No outbound transactions. So there's a lot of theories around this. Could it be token lockups in place for licensing? Or maybe it's just Coinbase custody securing institutions QNT. But then that leads you to think what institutions are buying up so much QNT? From what I've found on here, there's about a million quant within these wallets. So that's about seven and a half of the total supply right there. You can make what you will out of that. Since I've already explained the tokenomics in two of my previous quant breakdowns, I'll save repeating the functions of the QNT token, but the TLDR is it's for an overledger license to access the platform 
It's also the medium of exchange on Overledger OS for all the services on there, where every transaction will be paid for in QNT. And additionally, it's a sense of securing the network through staking tokens onto gateways for more throughput within the network and overall locking up more value within it. So for those people saying token not needed, well, that's actually a compliment towards Quant. We got to keep in mind their main focus isn't retail like us. It's on enterprises and governments. You can't expect these guys to be market buying QNT on Coinbase just so they can use their government or business operations. That'd be silly. So instead, Quant allows you to pay in fiat on the front end, but on the back end, it all gets converted into QNT as that's the form of payments on the network. The fiat option is really only there for convenience sake. So saying token not needed is the same as saying, wow, Quant, you guys did a great job at making payments via tokens as seamless as possible. It's almost like we're paying in just fiat. And so that pretty much wraps up the majority of our Quant deep dive. I know that was quite a lot of jam-packed information together. So in case you guys did miss anything or want to recap, remember the timestamps are right down below. So some key takeaways from this breakdown. Quant is working with some of the biggest players in the creation of central bank digital currencies. And with Gilbert Verdian's background, I'm sure there's tons more that we haven't seen yet. And we also now understand the scale of ODAP, what is now called SAT, and the overall vision for it. The scale of their partnerships, and of course, we can see now what Quant is doing is completely different from anything in crypto. They're not looking to be the next best layer one application or the next hottest DeFi dApp. Rather, they're working to allow all these networks not just in crypto but even legacy to all connect together and really form this future infrastructure for an open interoperable world i'm personally super excited to see quant continue to develop towards this future and having them really be at the forefront of creating this regulated internet of value through working with some of the largest globalized standard setting bodies in the world it's truly an exciting time to be in this space and of course i'll be continuing to accumulate and stack my quant bags and if you guys are curious and want to see where i'm looking to buy and sell my qnt be sure to join terra moon ventures and tune in to my free weekly show on there tea time with token every monday at 12 p.m pacific standard time where we take deep dives of projects initiatives and standards in the space and be sure to add my discount code tokenize for 25% off so you can save that 25% and stack more QNT tokens. And I'll be right down in the description below and I look forward to seeing you guys there. All right, but that pretty much does it for our quant deep dive today. I hope everyone got something good out of it, whatever it may be. The next piece coming out should be the Alliance Block deep dive. So if you haven't already, I'd suggest familiarizing yourself with the breakdown linked right up above here. And as always, if you guys enjoyed what you got out here today, be sure to leave a like and subscribe and turn that ringer on so you don't miss a thing. And don't forget to check out my other content platforms for more fundamental analysis content just like this on my Twitter, Spotify, Instagram, Telegram, and Medium. All this can be found at Tokenizer, or you can just head on over to tokenizer.network for all my links and content. And of course, this will all be down in the description below. Anyways, guys, as always, stay safe and keep grinding. I'll catch you guys next time. Peace.